Well, good morning and welcome to Buckhead Church Online. We're so glad that you joined us today. And you may not know this, but you are literally joining thousands of people from all over the planet today. But we're glad that you're here from wherever you're joining us. Hey, can you do me a favor really quickly? If you would, on whatever social platform that you like the best, if you would like, share, comment, uh, let people know that you are watching Buckhead Church today. You never know what uh, may rest in the balance of a very simple, share or a comment or a like, somebody will see it and then they will jump online and it could change their life forever and they'll have you to thank for that. So like, comment, and share whatever social platform you're on. We have a big service planned for today. Uh, in fact, in the middle of it, uh, we've got a, a something for you to participate in and it's really important uh, as the online community uh, to participate in what we do. But I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. Well, we're getting ready to get started, so go ahead and get your call coffee, uh, get comfortable. I'd say turn to your neighbor and say hello, uh, but we hope that you enjoy Buckhead Church today. Good morning and welcome to Buckhead Church. So glad to see you this morning. If you're joining us online, I'm glad to see you as well. If this is your first time with us, you are our special guest and we're so glad that you chose to spend the next hour uh, with us. Hey, we've got a very full service today, but I did want to mention one thing. We're in a season of connection right now. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we connected almost a thousand people into small groups, which is so fun and so exciting. But we realized that not everybody had an opportunity to connect that wanted to, and we wanted to create as much space as possible for everyone uh, to do so. So today we're launching short-term groups, uh, and short-term groups are affinity-based groups. Uh, they run about eight weeks, and it is the perfect opportunity to learn something new and to meet somebody new. And after eight weeks, if you don't love it, you can start all over. It's going to be great. So short-term groups launch today. You can get there by going to buckheadchurch.org slash the hub or clicking on the QR code just to the right there. Well, we're going to dive in and sing a little bit this morning. Tommy's here. Tommy, come on up here real quick. Tommy, uh, Tommy came in about 45 minutes ago on a bus. And so Tommy has been in Florida all week uh, or at least last week last night, uh, but he's here this morning and he's awake and he's ready to go. Uh, and, but we need your help as well. We want to make sure Tommy knows we're all with him. So if you're willing and able to stand, would you stand and let's uh, say hey to somebody. Welcome to Bucket Church. Tommy, take it away. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. Come on, let's sing about his faithfulness. Because that is Sing 
answered prayers back then You answered prayers Cause you are Yes, you are You provide
morning. I pray and ask that you bless everyone in this room. And I pray and ask that you let this message fill our hearts, Lord. We love you. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> I'm right on about that. <laughs> Thanks so much for singing with us. You may have a seat. Claudia, Tommy, thank you so much. And you guys sound amazing. It's like so good, especially when uh, when we can hear you sing. It's it's awesome. I love our church so much. And um, if you were here, joining us last week, you know that we kicked off a brand new series called Ecclesia. Uh, today is week two of that. And the series is all about, well, you. It's about us. It's about uh, what we call our church that Jesus actually called his gathering. And last week, Andy challenged us uh, to all participate. And so we thought today we'd give everybody an opportunity to participate, whether you're here in the room or whether you're online. As I was talking to you guys earlier, it's really important for our online crowd to do what we're about to do. Uh, and so, uh, as we said, we thought it'd make it really easy for you to participate in a very short survey that will help us know how well we're doing. Now, it shouldn't take more than two or three minutes, and we're going to do it right now. I know this is a little bit different, but we're going to do it right here in the room. That we have a, uh, everybody here, uh, and we'd love for everyone to take it, uh, so you, so we can get as much feedback as possible. Now, um, if you've only been coming for a short time, or maybe this is your first time and you're brand new, and you're thinking, "Well, I don't really have anything uh, to add that's helpful," that really couldn't be further from the truth. We would love to have your feedback. It's very significant and important to us. Uh, and this survey is tailored uh, to you, whether you've uh, attended one time or every time since the doors opened. So um, we're going to ask you some questions about your participation, uh, how uh, the leadership is doing and inspiring you to follow Jesus. And then we'll gather just a little bit of demographic information at the end to make sure that we're serving uh, every group as well as possible. So Let's do this together. If you'll go ahead and take out uh, your phone, your device, uh, if you were to put a QR code up here on the screen, uh, and that'll help us get started. Uh, and then after about three minutes or so, uh, we'll dive into part two of Ecclesia. Thank you so much uh, for uh, helping us out. We wanna make the best uh, experience for all of you. So thanks.
Living on Earth might make you feel small. You're just one of eight billion on this blue cosmic ball. So many characters with their roles to play. Perhaps many, if not most, still finding their way. Some who are given to athletic pursuits, while others find joy on educational routes. Those who build and those who farm. Those who sell widgets using their charm. But aren't we more than what we do? Being one of eight billion should give us a clue. On our own, it's difficult to make a big dent. Brokenness and need refuse to relent. Perhaps we were designed for a much grander endeavor. Not toiling alone, but pulling together. The planet is large, this much is true. But when God calls his people, there's so much we can do. Solve the world's problems? That does sound absurd. But maybe we can start with this strange little word. So um, here's something that more and more Americans are doing um, for entertainment. Um, predict outcomes for money, AKA gambling. But I just thought this was such a heavy word to start the sermon with. So we're just gonna go with predict outcomes for money. <clears throat> In fact, just show of hands, how many of you predicted outcomes for money on the Super Bowl? Just kidding, don't raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> Now, for the most part, predicting outcomes for money is kind of a harmless pastime. Um, for others, though, it's a very harmful pathway. And um, I, I, I don't know, I think wisdom says you don't know until you start, and then once you start, you realize, uh-oh, it's not the same for me as it is for everybody else, and maybe it's just not wise to start. Um, so I don't mean to make light of that. But the reason I even bring it up, other than just to get your attention, is this. And this is pretty amazing, this may be new for, for some of you, I don't know, Jesus actually predicted some outcomes, but not for money. In fact, nobody, and I mean nobody, would have put any money on any of his predictions because they were really, really bad odds. Then again, they were God odds. I don't know if God odds is actually a thing, but anyway, since he claimed to be the son of God, they were pretty good odds. But in the moment when Jesus began predicting things, nobody would have put any money on any of his predictions. They were just crazy. But as it turns out, all but a couple actually came to pass, which should lead us to believe that perhaps the ones that have not yet come to pass will in fact eventually come to, fact, to pass. Now, my favorite um, prediction made by Jesus, in fact, you know, a lot of people use the word prophecy, so we can use that, the, you know, the, my favorite prophecy in, in the New Testament or early in the whole Bible, but specifically my favorite Jesus prophecy, my favorite Jesus prediction about the future is actually us, the church, or the word he uses, his ecclesia. In fact, as we talked about last time, as we began this series, standing in the middle of literally nowhere, surrounded by a bunch of nobodies, at least culturally speaking, they were a bunch of nobodies. Um, Jesus asked them, if you'll remember, he said, hey, guys, what's the word on the street about me? What are people saying about me? Which is not a safe question for most of us to ask, unless you wanna get your feelings hurt, okay? So I don't recommend the question. But Jesus is like, hey, what are, what are people saying about me? And if you'll remember, Peter answered correctly. Peter said, well, I'll tell you who I think you are. Um, I, you know, the, we can tell you what everybody else thinks, but Jesus said, but yeah, but what do you think of who, who do you think I am? And Peter says, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're actually the king. I think you're God's final king. His word was, I think you're Messiah, the king. I think you're actually the son of God. And Jesus replied to Peter and the guys, yes, that is exactly who I am. And then he looks at Peter and he says, now let me tell you who you are. And I tell you that you are Peter, and the Greek word is like a rock, a little stone. He renames him, basically he renames him Rocky or literally stony or pebbly. I, that pebbly is not a, a great word nickname for a man. But anyway, so he says, I'm giving you a new name. And then he says this, and on this rock, and he uses a different Greek word. He uses the word Petra, which is like a huge outcropping of rock, the side of a mountain. And he's referencing Peter's answer to the question of who do, you, who do you think I am? When Peter said, I think you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is saying, you're exactly right. And on that foundation, on that outcropping of immovable mountainside, 
on that foundation, that Petra, that bedrock, that massive rock foundation, I will build my ecclesia, my assembly, my people, my people with a purpose, my people who will be a movement, people who will gather in my name to execute my mission. And guys, just in case you're wondering, because they're looking at each other like, is he crazy? Have we been out in the sun too long? What do you, he's talking about a new movement. He said, and my death or the gates of Hades, talking about his own death or death in general, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, he's saying, guys, even when I die, that's not the end of my movement. Even once I'm gone, my movement goes on. And not only was his death not the end, I mean, here we are. His death and resurrection actually launched the movement. Now, again, because of where we are and where we live, it's hard for us to get our minds around this and emotions around this. This was crazy talk. In fact, it's not just crazy, it's dangerous. <clears throat> pitting himself against the religious establishment and the Roman empire, which is exactly what he was doing. Because Rome, Rome did not like new movements. Every 50 years or so in that region of the world, some crazy person would come along and claim to be a Messiah and gather a following. And Rome would have to execute hundreds of people to quell that rebellion. There was always somebody claiming to be a Messiah. And here's Jesus standing out there in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by these guys basically saying, it's gonna happen again, but this time it's for real. Again, pitting himself against the religious establishment and the Roman empire, no way. Way. It happened. Here we are. My favorite Jesus prediction. Us. Today we're in part two of a series. We've called ecclesia, the word Jesus used to describe the Greek term Jesus used to describe his movement. And the word ecclesia, that's what it means. It means an assembly that comes together to accomplish something. And the reason we're doing this series is we're taking a look back to ensure that we as a local church and we as a network of local churches stay on track. Because while expressions of the Christian faith vary from generation to generation, culture to culture, the way we baptize changes, the way we sing changes, where where we gather, what the buildings look like, all of those things change. There is a core that never ever changes. Jesus' original intent for his assembly, for his movement has not changed. And we can't afford to lose sight of that, of, of that original idea of his original charge to his original first century followers. If we veer away from that, we get into trouble and we misrepresent Jesus to the world. Because here's what we all know from either personal history or just knowing a little bit of church history. When the church veers, things get weird, right? I mean, when the church veers away from Jesus' original intent, things get weird. When the church or a local church loses its way, people get hurt. Abuse with a divine excuse. People get hurt in Jesus' name. And God's name gets stamped on behaviors that God finds despicable. And there's always a chapter and a verse, there's always a chapter and a verse to support that despicable behavior. But then along comes, as we talked about last time, someone always comes along or a group always comes along and says, not on our watch. That was not Jesus' original intent. And we're calling the church back to what Jesus originally had in mind when he launched his assembly, his ecclesia. Now, why is this important? And why is it important for us to talk about it for a few weeks? And here's why. Because in our communities, whatever church you're in, in your communities, we are stewards of, or maybe a better word is, we are responsible for the church in our generation. And we're responsible for what the next generation thinks about when they think about church. Think about it. You're a Christian, if you're a Christian, when you're in the marketplace, when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're at school, wherever you are, if you're a Christian, you represent what Christianity is. And you, we can say all day long that Christianity is the following truths all written out, but in terms of reality and in terms of people's experience, you are, I am what Christianity is. We determine what people think about when they think about Christianity, when they think about the church. And if we are not in sync with Jesus' original intent, we mislead people because we misrepresent our King, we determine what Christianity looks like, acts like, and reacts like. So we are looking back to ensure that we as a local church and as a group of local churches stay on track. 
Any questions so far? Good, now today we're jumping right into the narrative. This is exactly what happened. We're gonna walk for the next few weeks through the storyline of the first church. Fortunately, a doctor named Luke, who actually wrote the gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, also documented the first few years of the church after the resurrection. Now, as I remind you at Easter, every Easter I remind you of this, that nobody anticipated, and this is so important for the storyline, nobody anticipated Jesus rising from the dead, nobody. They buried him as if he was going to do what dead people always do, which is stay dead. In fact, at Easter, I always do this little fill in the blank game with you. Let's see if we can do it even though it's not Easter. Every Easter I say this, nobody expected Nobody, that's exactly right. Five people paying attention, it's encouraging. <clears throat> that's right. Nobody expected nobody when they came to the grave. They expected Jesus to stay dead because that's what dead people do. So the resurrection took them by surprise, but the resurrection wasn't the only thing they didn't expect. Five weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, after he had appeared to hundreds of of people, according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Christians living in Corinth, one of the earliest Christian documents in existence, he said hundreds of people saw the resurrected Jesus. So about five weeks after his resurrection, he gathers his followers together, several hundred people, and he gives them kind of a farewell address. And as part of that farewell address, there's a very short Q and A. In fact, we only know of one question they ask, and here was their question. They're standing in front of the resurrected Jesus and they say, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, we've been praying for a Messiah that would restore our national identity and our national independence. And is this the time when you're gonna proclaim yourself a national king? Like in the days of David and in the days of Solomon when we had our independence? I mean, surely that's what's next. But that was not what was next. We were next. Ecclesia was next, but they didn't see it coming. So Jesus replied, it is not for you to know that he didn't make fun of their question. He just kind of avoided the question. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. It's kind of a dodge. It's like, you know what? That's not gonna happen now. It may happen later. And then he changes the subject. And then he says, let me tell you what it is time for. And he looks at this group of men and women whose hearts had been shattered and broken when he died. And now they're in the presence of a resurrected rabbi. And he says, let me tell you what's gonna happen. It's gonna be bigger. It's gonna be better. It's not gonna be focused on a piece of geography. It's not gonna be about a nation. It's gonna be for every nation. He says, here's what's gonna happen. You are gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant, or if we read the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would kind of drop in on people and leave, drop in on people and leave, drop in on people and leave. Jesus says, that day has come to an end. The Holy Spirit is going to drop in on all of you and stay, and when it does, you're gonna receive power. <laughs> and of course, they're thinking, yes, power. And what are we gonna do with our power? We're gonna expel the Romans, right? That's what we're gonna do with our power? Jesus smiles and says, no, you're gonna, the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you and with his power, you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, just to make sure you understand the geography, Jerusalem's the city, Judea's the region. He said, you're gonna be my witnesses in the city of Jerusalem and in the region of Judea, to which they thought witnesses, a witness is somebody who testifies in court. So we're all going to court, Jesus continues, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, to which they thought, no, 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 those aren't our people. We don't even go to Samaria, Samaria. We don't even like the Samaritans. And Jesus continues and he says, and to the ends of the earth. And they're thinking, oh, that kind of witness, not like a witness in court, somebody who's gonna go out and tell people what they've witnessed, what they've seen, but Jesus, come on, you know, surely this is hyperbole. You don't really literally mean the ends of the earth. Like this isn't going to Egypt. I mean, this, this certainly isn't going to Rome. Hyperbole, right? But it wasn't. Jesus was serious. Again, here we are. It's why it's my favorite Jesus 
Prediction. Now, by the way, I gotta catch you up on a little cultural thing. This is really important. In our culture, we think about a bunch of different religions and people sometimes swap religions. They leave one to join the other. That was, that was unheard of in the ancient world. People didn't leave religions. There was no such thing as religions in the ancient world. There were just regions with gods and then people had household gods. And if you move from one region to the next, you would bring your household gods. You may secretly worship the God of your original region, but then eventually you would begin to worship the gods of the region you move to. This is how everybody thought in the ancient world. Everybody had their own God. You worship your God, I'll worship mine. And Rome didn't care who you worship as long as you obey Caesar. But the problem was the Jesus movement didn't work that way. The problem with the Jesus movement is that it wasn't a, you might also like. In other words, you couldn't just add Jesus to your household gods. You couldn't add Jesus to your regional gods. This was a either or proposition. Either you worship the pagan gods or you chose to worship Jesus and God and Jesus Father as your one and only true God. So here's what was amazing. Jesus was sending them out into different regions of the world to convince people not to leave their religion to join a new religion. He was sending them out into the world to convince them to abandon their entire world view. That there are no gods, even though your parents thought there were and your grandparents and your great grandparents. In other words, everybody you know assumes there are many gods. Nope. There's only one God and the God you've been worshiping and the God your great grandmother that you thought was so precious, the gods that she worshiped were no gods at all. And not only is there one God, this God became a human. And this God revealed what God is like. And then this God died to pay for your sin to which non-Jewish people and people in these various regions, if they heard the word sin, they had no concept for sin. Sin was a new concept because the pagan gods didn't have any sins you weren't allowed to commit. The gods required sacrifice, not obedience. So this is an entirely different worldview. Everything about this was unprecedented. And obviously as they listened to Jesus teach, they had to be thinking, this isn't going anywhere. I mean, it might work inside Judea where we have a lot of sons and daughters of Abraham who understand Torah and Yahweh and he's given us the law and there's only one God. I mean, this might, we might be able to sell this in Judea and maybe Galilee, but not Egypt, certainly not Rome. But when you've seen someone die and you visited their tomb and they're standing in front of you talking, you take them seriously. And so even though they didn't understand it, even though there's no way they could comprehend what Jesus was saying, they're like, okay, whatever you say. So he sends them back to Jerusalem. And then Luke tells us what happened next. This is amazing. The text says this, Luke says they all joined together. Now Luke knew all of these people. That's why he has all this detail. And he's about to give us extraordinary detail. In fact, one of the amazing things, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian or you've, all, you know, you've heard all kinds of stuff about the Bible. In fact, you have a strong opinion about the Bible, but if you're honest, you've never read it, but you're sure you know what it is and isn't. And I get that. There's a lot of things I have opinions about that I don't know anything about. I'm like you. I read the headlines of a story and I think I'm educated and I start talking about it. Somebody's like, did you read the article? No, I read the headline. I'm, I'm fully informed. Okay, so we, we all do that. I get that. Luke, if you, you should read the gospel of Luke. It has so much detail and you can't help but think, wait a minute. I think this guy actually looked into this. This isn't just, you know, religious jabber. Anyway, here's, here's, here's what he says. He says, all these people that Jesus said, hey, you're gonna have power, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. They all joined together constantly. This wasn't like a 30 minute thing. Constantly in prayer, along with, and Luke gives us this detail because this again was unprecedented and unheard of. Luke knew if he didn't tell us this next part, we would just envision a bunch of men together because that was the culture they lived in. Luke's like, no, I, gotta, I hate to break it to you guys. The world was changing as a result of the teaching of Jesus. They were constantly in prayer along with the women. Wait, wait, men and women praying in the same room, same area, yeah. And Mary, the mother of Jesus was there along with Jesus' brothers. <laughs> his brothers? I didn't even know Jesus had brothers. Where have his brothers been? When you read the gospels, his brothers actually thought, well, 
his brothers actually questioned Jesus' sanity. But again, before you're too critical, if, you're, if your older brother decided he was God's you know, gift to humanity or the Messiah, you'd think your brother lost his mind as well. They just thought Jesus was kind of crazy. But here they are praying, waiting for Jesus to fulfill this promise. What happened? What changed their mind? Not his teaching, his resurrection. The brothers are there along, along with the brothers. Um, two weeks later, so they pray day after day after day, they're praying. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem and wait. And they're like, how long do we have to wait? And then it happened. About two weeks later, about two weeks later, they're meeting together and it's a festival day in Jerusalem. It's called the day of Pentecost. It's a Pentecost celebration. Pentecost celebration, all the Judean men, not, excuse me, not Judean, all the sons of Abraham, regardless if they were from Judea or not, basically we would say all the Jewish men were supposed to leave whatever region of the world they lived in and come back to Jerusalem for this feast day. So on the day of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem is packed and it's packed with men and some women and some families from all over the empire. These are sons and daughters of Abraham, but they have been dispersed into different parts of the world, but they're returning to the homeland, they're returning to Jerusalem to celebrate this sacred festival. And when on this day, while this group was praying, the Holy Spirit, in fact, exactly like Jesus predicted, fell on this group of people and gave them power. <clears throat> but a power, again, they never saw it coming. This was all so unexpected. Suddenly, they were able to understand and speak the languages of all of these primarily men who had come to the city of Jerusalem from all around the empire. Now, why in the world did God use that particular sign gift? Why in the world did God empower them to do that? And here's why. Because the arrival of Jesus and the message of Jesus was in fact good news of great joy for all people. When Jesus said, this is for the world, he was not exaggerating. It was not hyperbole. All means all and everybody means everybody. And so they go into the streets and they begin to preach and tell the story of the life and specifically the death and resurrection of Jesus. And these people from all these different regions of the empire are hearing it in the language of the region from which they've traveled. And they are shocked. They, they, this is unbelievable. Here's, Luke says, here's how they responded. Wait a minute. Aren't all those who are speaking, and again, we miss this, this is so important. Aren't all these who are speaking not Judeans, not Jewish, Galileans. In other words, this is the working class people from way up north. I mean, they're not even from Judea. They're not even all that cool. They're like, the, they're, we can tell by their accents, they're Galileans and here they are in Jerusalem and these uneducated Galileans, they're able to speak not a different language, but the languages from, of the empire. How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? language. Again, how can these uneducated Galileans know our language? And then Luke, because he doesn't want to miss the detail, he actually lists the different regions of the empire from which this group came. And he just gives us the list. I'm not going to read the whole list. He says there were men there from Parthia, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, all these different areas, Egypt, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs, over 14 different regions that he takes the time to say, there were people from all over the world, which wouldn't shock anybody because that's what happened every Pentecost celebration. But these men, primarily men, are hearing the gospel in their language from uneducated Galileans. Here's again what they said. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? mean. And Peter steps up to the mic. Well, he just stepped up. <clears throat> and he says, I'm glad you asked. And Peter preaches a message. You should read it. It's amazing. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Here's, here's kind of the gist of it. People of Israel, he says. In other words, all of you sons and daughters of Abraham, people of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. Why of Nazareth? Because we wanna make sure it's the right Jesus. These are, these are common names. This is why he had you know, a descriptor like everybody in that era. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God. In other words, God stamped his approval on him 
to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. In other words, he didn't just claim a lot of stuff. He did a lot of stuff, which God did, here it is, among you. And this is what becomes evident when you hear this sermon, that the men and women that were sons and daughters of Abraham, even those outside the region of Judea and Galilee had heard stories of a wonder worker, a rabbi with a different message, a, a rabbi that supposedly was able to heal the sick allow the lame to walk. And the rumor was he even healed a blind young man who had been blind from birth. By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know, this isn't a secret, this isn't new information for you. And this man, talking about Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, he blames them, you, as part of the nation, you with the help of wicked men, probably talking about the Romans or maybe even the religious leaders in the city, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. And you could hear a pin drop. And I think he paused for effect. And then he says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because because just as he predicted, the gates of hell will not impede my movement. Just as he predicted, because it was impossible for death, he personifies death, for death to keep its hold on him. Then later in the, in the same sermon, he, he says this, he says, he goes back to the resurrection. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are witnesses of the fact. They finally understand what it means to be a witness. They are the ones who witnessed the crucifixion. They are the ones who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And their job was to take what they had seen and what they had heard to all of the world, but God, brought the world to them on the day of Pentecost. He continues, therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and King. The Gentiles would understand this word. Judeans and Galileans and sons and daughters of Israel understood this word. He has made him your boss. He has made him your king. God's final king has come. And Luke tells us, because Peter was there, Matthew was there, Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. There's all these witnesses to this event. You couldn't make this up. When the people heard this, when the people heard this, they were, I love this phrase, they were cut to the heart. You know what that means? That means all of their resistance evaporated. All of their pushback evaporated. Everything they've been throwing out as excuses and reasons not to believe in its rumors and you can't believe and there's no way that happened. Ever, all of their defenses just melted and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, attend church regularly. <laughs> no, that wouldn't have made any sense. This isn't a building. This isn't an event, this is a movement for the world. Peter replied, you need to believe a list of propositional truths and we're gonna start a class this afternoon and there's 15 things you need to understand and there's sub points between, no. Because this wasn't about a what, this was about a who. He said, here's what you gotta do. Peter replied, repent change your mind and be baptized, every single one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Now, this is so important, don't, don't move, don't leave, listen. The men, primarily men and women, in this audience were good people. These weren't wild and crazy sinners. When you think of a sinner, you're like, I'm not a sinner. I know some sinners, I'm not, they, there's not those people. The, these men and women were so devout, such great law keepers, so committed to Torah, they actually spent money to travel to Jerusalem for this festival. These are really, really good people. So why in the world does Peter say to them, you need to repent of your sin and ask God to forgive you? What, what, what sins? Is he talking about it? He doesn't even know these people. What's he referring to? What sins? All of their sins. 
all of their past sins, all of the sins they thought got forgiven because they sacrificed an animal, they sacrificed a dove, they sacrificed a lamb, they sacrificed a ram, all of their sins. He said, no, 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 those days are over. The temple days and the temple ways are over. From now on, forgiveness is not found in ceremony and forgiveness is not found in your works and forgiveness is not found in your consistency and forgiveness is not found in your tenacity to obey Torah. From now on, for you and for the world, forgiveness is found in the name of Jesus, that his death on the cross as the lamb of God was the final payment for sin. He says to these good Judean and Galilean and people from all over the world people, he says, all of your sins have been forgiven, but now you must change the way you're thinking. You must leave the temple way of thinking and join the ecclesia of Jesus where you will find ultimate forgiveness for your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin because he's paid for the sins of the world. He's paid for your sin. He's paid for my sin. Paul would come along later. He had a hard time with this until he became a Jesus follower and he would write these words. These are my, it's my version of Paul's words. He would say, there is now no condemnation. You ever felt condemned because of something you've done to somebody else or to yourself? Broken another promise, broken a promise to yourself. There's therefore now no condemnation by God for those who are in relationship with King Jesus. This was the message on the day of Pentecost, two very, very good Torah abiding, Torah obeying Judeans, Galileans, sons and daughters of Israel. It's a new day, there's a new way. There was nothing wrong with the old way, but something new has come. He says, and when you do that, you will receive, and this meant so much to this group of people, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise, and now he talks about me. And now, now Peter talks about you. This is amazing. And he, again, he couldn't anticipate any of this. He says, the promise is for you, the people in the audience, and for your children, the people who will come after you, and for all who are far off, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's us. We were, we're far off geographically. We're far off chronologically. But Peter says, I understand it now. This is good news of great joy for all people in every single generation. This is who we are. These are our people. This is our message. This is our hope. This is our future. This is what we're to reflect in our daily lives. And, and how do the audience respond? It's amazing. And those who accepted his message were baptized, apparently that day or in the days to come. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So day one, opening day of the church, launched as Jesus intended, launched as we must keep it, an outward facing, multicultural, multiplying movement not a church service, not a list of theology, an outward facing, this is for the whole world. How do we keep it outward facing? Multicultural, it's for every generation, it's for every nation, it's for every tribe, it's for every tongue, it's for every color. Multiplying, it's just not my four and no more. We're not gonna hunker down and wait for Jesus to come and rescue us from this sin-filled world. I don't know how in the world Christians got all wound up on that, but you don't find that on the lips of Jesus. It is an outward facing, multicultural, multiplying movement. 3,000 people in a city that isn't, we, don't, we think of big cities, it wasn't a big city like we think about big cities. 3,000 people was a significant percentage of the population. And these people were then gonna go back to their regions of the world. God brought the world to Jerusalem that day for this message. 14 language groups, this was unimaginable. Now I know not everybody likes a big church, I get this, but I'm telling you, day one was huge. And as Jesus predicted, this is so important, as Jesus predicted, central to his new movement, his ecclesia, was this one simple idea, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. The thing that held it all together, the glue, the epicenter, the centrality, the thing that can never be tweaked or changed is that he is the Messiah, the King, the son of the living God. And this new movement was anchored to one indisputable event, his resurrection which brings us back to us. So what? 
Now what? Here's what. Repent. 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 You, me, repent. Acknowledge Jesus as your king. Acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and submit to his lordship. And then be baptized. You need to be baptized because baptism is how we publicly acknowledge that we're part of the movement of Jesus. Baptism is how we publicly acknowledge that we're in, that we have decided publicly to follow Jesus for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins. And I don't know your name and I don't know your story, but I know you're a sinner. And here's how I know that, because you've hurt somebody. You've hurt somebody that God loves, which means you've offended God. If you hurt my children, you don't just make it up with my children. You gotta talk to me. Not only have you offended people and hurt people that God loves, you've hurt yourself who God loves. You, you have a debt that you can't pay, that you owe other people, but you have a debt that you can't pay to your heavenly father because the only way to make it right is to go back in time and undo what you've done and you can't do that, which means you're stuck and I'm stuck and we're stuck and the world was stuck. And then Jesus came and paid the debt that you cannot pay. And the invitation that day and this day is to accept that gift, the gift of forgiveness. And when you accept the gift of forgiveness, you will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will empower you to live the life that God has invited you to live. And if you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready, he's ready. So what I wanna do, just as Peter invited that initial group, that original group to respond immediately, I'm inviting you today, whether you're watching online, whether you're at one of our churches, whether you're sitting by yourself or driving somewhere and you're just listening, I wanna invite you today to do exactly what he says. I want you to repent. I want you to change your mind about where you stand with God and who you think Jesus is. And I want you to decide to publicly, publicly align with the ecclesia of Jesus to live this out in such a way that people understand what the church is and who the church is that you'll accept forgiveness for your sins and acknowledge that you need forgiveness. And when you do, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will empower you to live the life that you have been invited to live. So here's what we're gonna do. In just 15 seconds, I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, and I'm gonna lead you into prayer. And if this is your day, I want you to pray it out loud, and I'm gonna make it easy for you. I want all the Christians here to pray out loud as well. Because I want those of you where you're thinking, you know what, I've been thinking about it, I've been considering it, or maybe while I'm preaching, it's like there's something on the inside of you just kind of lit up, that wouldn't be, I am not that good. That is the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to respond today. And if you do, God will fulfill this promise to you because it is for all people. So if you would, Bow with me, all of our campuses, wherever you are, if you're sitting on the couch with somebody at home, everybody together, would you just pray out loud with me? Say, Heavenly Father, no more running, no more resisting, I'm yours. I'm placing my faith in Christ's death on the cross as payment for my sin. If you lead, I'll follow. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life, beginning now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd love to pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that it's for everybody. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin I know Paul said he was the chief among sinners, but I, my whole life I've known better. And at times I don't do better. And you've forgiven me anyway, thank you. So Father, for the men and women, the student, whoever it is that maybe this was the first time it clicked for them, would you give them the courage to follow through? And I pray that you would light them up on the inside, that you would pierce their heart like you did in those early days. And that this would be the beginning of a new life in Christ. And we pray all of that in the matchless name of our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Amen. Christ.
Tommy, thank you so much. Thank you so much for singing with us and being here today. Uh, if today was the day that you made a decision to follow Jesus, welcome. We're so excited for you. We know that many of you, you hear a message like that that may raise questions, uh, questions about baptism or, or maybe even just questions or doubts or fears that all of us have had at one time or another. If you go to the hub today, you can find out about baptism, but you can also find out about Starting Point. Starting Point is a short-term group that is the best place to begin a conversation around the doubts and fears and questions that you have. We'll see you next week for part three of Ecclesia. Until then, have a great week and thanks for being here.